Hey there. So today is an extremely special day. I am so honored to be here with Kathy Hall, who is the Chief Customer Officer at IFS. Kathy, thank you so much for taking the time in your afternoon, my morning, for to have this conversation. Yeah, thanks, Cheryl, for having me on. Super, super excited. Yeah, so I was very inspired by all of the work that you've done and also not just the work that you've done, but your philosophy around your work. So I'm super excited to talk to you about the importance of humility, how you have it as a philosophy and a mission for yourself and how you run your very successful global teams. But before we jump into that, I thought I would ask, you know, was there anything that, you know, as a younger person, well, you're still extremely young, but when you were even younger, was there anything that inspired you to greatness or maybe something that was even difficult that you were just really bent on, you know, overcoming? Like what spurred you to achieve what you've achieved so far? I think it's really interesting, isn't it? Because you you get to a certain age or maybe you get to, to a certain level of, of seniority and you start to think, what what was it? What was different about me? You know, what what made me special or meant that I took a leap that maybe somebody else didn't take? And and I, I think if you'd have asked me 20 years ago, I, I couldn't have given you an answer. Um, but I think over time you start to realize that the the things in your early life and how they affect you as an individual and a person. Um, and, and obviously everyone has a very different story. I didn't have a particularly happy childhood. Um, I, I didn't feel like I belonged at home. I was badly bullied uh, at school. I didn't really have any friends um, and, until I was much, much older. And I remember this one teacher, Mrs. McGregor, um, and she somehow made me feel like I belonged and she somehow kind of instilled in me that if I wanted my life to change, if I wanted to be in control of my life and make decisions and live my life in a different way, education was my route to, to be able to do that. And I can't remember a particular conversation. I can't remember, you know, a, a particular moment but as my life's progressed, I remember that feeling and that one teacher who made me feel that it was important and this was something I was good at. And actually now if I look back at, at those early years, it was books, it was homework, it was education, it was learning that was my solace. That was the place where I thrived and that was a place that I really enjoyed and that enabled me to, through some difficult situations and difficult circumstances, always follow a particular path of, of education and learning. And then from that meant that I could really excel um, in my career. So, yeah, 20 years ago, I probably couldn't have put that together. But as I look back and reflect, I think that early inspiration around education and that that deep then belief that actually I could change things. I could be in control of my own destiny. I just had to learn how to do it, but that was absolutely possible. You know, that that deep belief has, has definitely made a massive impact um, in my life. Yeah. So, I mean, huge shout out to teachers and educators because they massive. really, in, you know, in, in your case, you know, probably changed the trajectory of your life. I mean, it really opened exactly. your eyes to what is possible. And on the same hand, I wanted to point out, you know, the, the power of people's words, you know, as a young person, and it can be amazing, like your teacher, or it can also be, you know, to your detriment, you know, or something. So if anyone out there is, is listening, really listen to these words and maybe even, you know, absorb or latch onto the words that uh, Kathy's teacher told her because they are absolutely and a hundred percent true. And also maybe evaluate some of the things that you've heard growing up or when you were or when you were younger that maybe aren't necessarily, you know, true as well. So thank you so much for sharing that story. 
And, and also, so in your ascent, in your successful ascent, were, did anything ever go off the rails? Were there any challenges or did you just, was it a straight shot from, you know, A to B? I mean, it's never a straight shot from, from A to B. I think I was really lucky um, in the fact that I had good people around me. And, and I think this is what really starts to sow this seed of, of leading with humility. And it really comes down to recognising what your strengths are and what's your secret source and what are the strengths of the people around you. And I'm clever, that's great, but I'm not the cleverest in the room. And I'm very rarely the, the expert on any particular topic. But I got to understand that that was OK. Actually, it wasn't about being the cleverest person in the room. It was about understanding, about being able to listen, about being able to link together the different opinions and understand um, different points of view and be able to craft those together and build on those together in order to deliver an outcome. So I think there were times when I didn't know how to get to the outcome that I needed. But I always knew that if I listened to the people around me, if I took advice, if I worked out who I needed in that team around me, and if I treated them with, with dignity, if I had the humility to really listen, to take that feedback, that I could find a path through. And, and that was something that, you know, I learned really early on. Um, I went into a technical career without a technical background. So probably it was quite easy to learn that because, you know, I, I didn't understand that that technology part of it. But actually, I could lead people. I had those project management skills, I had those organizational skills, I had the, the communication and persuasion and influencing skills that perhaps a lot of my peers within the technology organizations didn't necessarily have. So you sort of learned very early on to pull all those different parts um, together and to be able to simplify quite complex topics. Um, and, and through that, you always found a path through. So I don't think I ever stood there and thought, I can't do this. I think it's 100% to say I could never have done it alone. It's always a team effort. And I think by understanding that and by working for the team and by being the person who also wants to lead the team not everybody wants to to lead the team different people want different things out of their career they get their motivation in different ways some people love leading people some people love being a line manager but it's not for everybody some people you know really like to get super focused and sort of work on on technology and get inspired by innovation um so i think I always knew I could pull together the secret source from the people around me. And if I couldn't, if there was a gap in the team that actually we could surface that gap and we could find a really proactive and positive way to fill that gap by perhaps leaning on somebody from um, outside the organization or a partner organization or bringing someone in or, or even often bringing people up through the organization. So, you know, you can often find that you're in a in a group of quite you know senior people and you're just lacking some of that inspiration and some of those wacky ideas and actually bringing some some um different thinking and different perspectives into that group gives a very different dynamic and that can help unlock some of those challenges and some of those blockers so yeah i think i learned that early on that that it's a team sport, it's a team effort, and then how you treat the people in, in the team and how you work with the people in the team and how you blend together people's skills um, and, and having the kind of humility to, to do that and to work with people um, is something that is super powerful. It generates fantastic results, but it's also really fun, right? It's really, really good fun to work with those different personalities and different people, and it's very, very rewarding especially when you see those people being successful um, in their own right too. Mm -hmm. And one thing that really struck me is that it, it seems like if leaders can lead with humility, it creates safety for the people around them to be as creative and to shine as much as they can. 
And so that seems like it's an important component of your leadership because it really helps people rise to the top because that humility creates safety. Am I am I off base or does that make sense? No. What are your thoughts? Yeah, and, and I think that's exactly right. And the piece that I'd add to that is it also creates safety to make um, mistakes because, you know, the path from from a kind of a great idea to delivering that in, you know, real life for customers with customers, that's never straight. That's never a kind of straight A to B. And, and often in that, there's kind of false steps. There's things that worked at the time, but don't really stand the test of time. There's ideas that just turn out to be bad. But often, you know, you unpack those ideas and you blend them with something else and you put them back together and suddenly, you know, you've got a whole that's much more powerful than than the sort of original piece. So I think having that safety to fail, having that safety and being that bit vulnerable in front of people, um, even a good idea, if you unpack it and put it back together after challenge will be a better idea than, than when it started off. And I think people having that sense and feeling that safety gives them the ability to be creative, but also to challenge each other respectfully. And in that respectful challenge, there, there's a lot of kind of innovation and success that's also unleashed. Yeah, I love that when you say it's the safety to fail, because what I hear over and over from many different areas, many different amazing leaders such as yourself and also thought leaders that, you know, failure is progress. And I know that uh, I think Seth Godin, hopefully I'm going to get this quote right, but he's like thrash quickly, you know, yeah. in other words, get in and really having that, um, that safety to fail. I think that is so very important because that's when you can come up with a genius. And so that is really amazing. And it takes them, you know, a lot of humility on your part and also confidence and courage on a leader's part to be a little bit exposed to the fact that I don't have all the answers and, you know. And, and so I, I, I think sort of Jim Collins sums this up the best when he talks about, you know, the leader who, if the if the team succeeds, the team has succeed succeeded. If the team fails, then you failed as a leader. And I think you know, combined with the humility, you have to be able to stand up and accept that if it goes wrong, that's on you. That's not on anyone else. That's only on you. But when it's successful, that's the team's success. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I think that's an important characteristic as well. And I think. That's more important um, today in, in today's leadership climate than it's ever been before. I think the days of the leader who who sort of stands up and takes all the credit for, for the team actions and sort of points a finger in the other direction when things don't really go to plan. I, I, I don't think there's there's much scope for those kind of leaders um, in the diverse global organizations that we work with today. Yeah. And no, agreed 100%. But I want to ask you a question and you can, you may or may not agree with me, but it seems like in my, you know, just in coaching and training and working with female executives that I've had the honor of working with, a lot of times female leaders, they're not likely to take and accept the successes they will actually, I want to say, do what you're doing to a fault, but they will not take ownership of their amazing leadership. Like, so what is the balance and why is that important rather than to just deflect all of the success to the team? Like, how do you give credit where credit is due, but also say, yes, I am Kathy. I led this project. This is how I was instrumental. I mean, so how do leaders, female leaders, get the visibility and ownership of success while still giving credit to their team? And I think that's a great question. Um, and, and I agree. I think it's something that it's harder to do as a female. You know, we, we talk a lot about equality in the workplace, but it really stems from social equality and those conventions and the way that we're brought up, um, you know, uh, a small boy is is kind of 
bossy than actually they're authoritative, they're a natural leader, but a small girl is bossy and, well, they're just bossy and nagging. You know, there, there's lots of these stereotypes that we're brought up with. You know, girls are taught to not be boastful, to um, play down their achievements. No, nobody likes anyone who shows off. Don't You don't want to be a show off. And I, and I think that's really difficult to, to overcome. I think it's easier in the workplace. I think we've got better at internal communications. I think when people see you as a leader standing up time and time and time again to celebrate success, even when it's the people around you, that success really comes with you. I think then when you're talking outside your organization and, and again, celebrating success, it's something, you know, you're part of the team, you've led the team. So, so you take that success along with everyone else. Um, but I agree, there is a quite a difficult balance. And, you know, even I feel, I feel very confident standing up in the boardroom and saying, um, you know, this is the success I've, I've delivered along with my team. But, but I feel much less um, confident sort of standing up in my friendship group and saying, oh, you know, look at my wonderful career. Whereas maybe some of the men in that friendship group are, uh, you know, less reticent to 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 show off some of their achievements. So I do think we've a, a way to go, um, and a lot of it comes down to that social complexity and social convention, rather than who we are as leaders um, in the work environment. Yeah, yeah, a hundred percent. And I just think that I see sometimes, you know, if you know, I think it's important so women can increase their visibility, you know, so I think just thinking through the, the, the baby steps. And like you were saying, when you're delivering success of the team, but also at a minimum taking jo joint ownership. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, there's a community, any, any kind of project, anything that's a big enough stage or even a small enough stage, you know, have that communication strategy, make sure you're clear uh, as a leader or even someone involved in that team, how are you going to celebrate success? How are you going to communicate progress? How are you going to, to communicate the outcomes and be clear on the outcomes? And I think, you know, that whole communication strategy around the things that we do at work is really, really important. And, and actually, I think it becomes a little bit easier for us when we see it as a structure, a plan, something that we follow. And OK, I need to send that blog. OK, I need to do that LinkedIn post. Okay, you know, I need to do that that post on the internal comms. Um, I need to send that newsletter, whatever it is, it becomes a lot easier because we've got a plan and a structure around it. Certainly for me, that's that makes it easier to to sort of highlight um that success. Mm -hmm. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, so that is definitely a good place, a good place to start and just thinking about, you know, how, you know, in ways to consistently, even if it's baby steps, to get your work out there, to start talking about in a way that you're comfortable about. And then, you know, so at the end of the day, you're a female executive in tech. And yes. so there probably had to be some, you know, it couldn't have been easy. Has there ever been a, you know, a setback and, you know, what has been the importance? Because based on, you know, my work and your work to kind of combine it and talk about mindset for a minute. What has allowed you to not just keep going, but to really thrive as you're you're climbing in your career? Yeah, so I think it's 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 interesting, isn't it? Because oh, crikey, hold on one sec. It's okay. It's just okay. Sorry about that. Um, I kept you still. So I think it's interesting when when you look at that mindset. Um, for me, it's got to be about resilience, um, and and I think it's as much about resilience in the workplace. And I know we keep talking about it, but we bring our whole selves to work, right? We don't. We're not. A, we are slightly different people, maybe at work and at home, but we're still one whole, right? And I think for me, a lot of the resilience is not just about how you get on at work it's also how you navigate that that kind of social um part and I think the hardest issues that I've had to face in my career are not work related issues um I'm really lucky that that I've not had to to kind of um 
face any sexism or anything like that in any of the workplaces um, that I've been involved in. But I have had, you know, friends who are no longer friends because they didn't agree with my choices around childcare, around, you know, jetting off around the world to, to be an executive and leaving sort of babies and toddlers and, and things at home. And, you know, I'm proud to be mum to three boys. Um, and they're all older now and they've all got across the other side. And, you know, I'm very, very proud of them and their achievements. And I know they're proud of, of me and my achievements. But but I think understanding the goal, the outcome, you know, what is it you're trying to get to and 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 then having that resilience. And it's something that, you know, I clearly got good at because then I ended up running ultra marathons. And it's a very, very similar process, right? You imagine the finish line. And, and so you've done that mental rehearsal on the finish line. And then, you know, every single step of the journey, you know how it's all broken up and you break things down into manageable pieces. And, and that might be, actually, I've got to travel for three weeks and I'm not going to see my two, three, four year olds for, for three weeks and how mentally I'm going to get through that time. Or that might be, you know, I've got to prepare for a big board meeting and I need to pull together kind of all these um, updates and progress from all these different areas and craft that story and how do I work that back and so I think all of these big events you know we've got to get um, a, a new digital transformation project live you know it doesn't it doesn't matter what it is big or small it doesn't matter whether it's more on the social side or the personal side or the work side it's breaking things down into manageable chunks making sure there's a plan around it, making sure there's consistency, making sure that um, you build in time for yourself and, and time for your own self-care as well. And, and then making sure that you've got that goal in mind and you know what the finish line looks like. And then you've got that stamina to just go through all the pieces because you've broken it down into things that are manageable. So I think that's one of the biggest mindset kind of pieces that I um that I learned and and sometimes you don't know how you're going to get through each of those little pieces but you know you can get through the next one and then you know you can get through the next one and then you know you can get through the next one and I think you know that resiliency is important um it is important for people I think it's harder for women if I'm honest because I think we have more we perceive we have more responsibilities, right? So I think it's a lot harder for us to leave, you know, our perceived responsibilities about children and parents and home life at the office door. Um, I, I think, you know, it's not a woman only issue and, you know, everyone's on a, on a spectrum with that somewhere. But I, you know, I know, if, if my house is untidy, I feel personally responsible for that, even if I'm two weeks away from home in, you know, the other side of the world, somehow it's my fault. Um, and, and I think we we need to, to break away from that and break away from some of those social conventions. But I, I think that resiliency really helps that because you also start to prioritise and start to say, actually, I need to focus on this step at the moment. And therefore, these things are going to be lower down my priority list. Yeah, so important. And, it, you know, we just can't ignore the cultural and social indoctrinations that like you were mentioning, a lot of times the toughest ones that women are up against are coming from the people that they care about the most. And so those are sometimes challenging to be resilient with. Uh, but it seems like what you're saying too, when it comes to those, some of those conventions, whether it's the house or childcare, or what have you, really don't be afraid to raise your hand and say, I need some help, you know, and just, you know, follow what's in your heart and your gut and what's important to you. Yeah, I think absolutely. And, you know, it, I mean, I'm an incredibly supportive husband, um, but he also, had he saw the other side of this you know he would have to leave um work on time or early to to go and do the school run and people would say to him well where's your wife like why why's your wife not doing the school run so I think you know sometimes we we don't always see the other side as well um and and society's actually got quite a long way to catch up with the the modern global workplace um 
and I think some countries are further ahead than others. But there's still, yeah, a lot of um, a lot of convention. And, and what I'd say to people is, don't live your life based on other people's conventions. You need to kind of do it based on like how you balance that out for you personally and what's important for, for you personally. And, you know, I, I can look back and I've had an amazing career. I've had such interesting, exciting challenges. I've had points, you know, where it has been difficult at work, long hours, but it's always been super fun. I've always been around a super group of people. And like I've still brought up three sons they're absolutely fine. You know, they're not, they're not in any way affected. And when we talk about, you know, they're older now, so they're um, all late teens. And what they remember about their childhood is the time that we went kayaking or the time that we went camping, or do you remember when we stopped out under the stars? Or do you remember that trip to Paris? They don't remember really, well, I went to daycare and you weren't there, or I stopped at grandma's because you'd gone traveling with work for two weeks. They're not the things that they talk about. They don't say, oh, remember that awful dinner we had because you weren't home to cook it, mom. They say, oh, do you remember when, you know, we went on this amazing adventure? Um, so I, I just, I would just encourage everybody to, to not to make sure they're not making decisions based on other people's conventions and, and really stay true to themselves um, and build on their own strengths and, and their own direction and their own moral compass. Mm -hmm. That is such great uh, nuggets of wisdom. So that I need to reiterate and that do not make your decisions based on other people's or conventional wisdom, base it on what is in your heart and for you individually. So that is so important and also resiliency. And that's something that I heard over and over growing up as well. And, you know, also what you spoke about before is beginning with the end in mind. You know, you may not have all the answers, but my favorite quote ever is proceed as if success is inevitable. So, mm -hmm. you know, and then like, okay, the project is gonna be amazing. So what's the next best step? and then working it backwards from there. So I love that. I am 100% all in on that. And so when it comes to, you touched on leading with humility and the importance of it. Can you share anything else for leaders or emerging leaders? Because sometimes if you're in a position of power, so if you're a chief customer officer, you know, some people might be saying, well, it's easier for you to lead with humility because you know, you're in the role that you're in. But what what advice, and that may or may not be true, but it just may be the perception, but what advice do you have for emerging leaders who may feel that it's not safe for them to be that vulnerable? Yeah, I think it, it, it yeah, it's a good question. I think that there's, there's always a part that's around humility. There's a part that's around data as well and where you get that data from. And I think, you know, being open to different data sources, being open to maybe being able to back up some of the thinking with data, but also being just open to work in partnership with people or help people. I think, you know, to, to look around your colleagues and understand that somebody is as a strength that you can use um, and they have strengths that that they can use, you know, that what makes for a better working environment. I think it's not. I think being in work with the mindset of, well, maybe there's six of us and there's one promotion and I want that promotion and, and I'm therefore, you know, not going to listen to the people around me or I'm going to try and take all the credit for something or I, I don't think that's really the kind of organic organizations that we tend to to work in now I think there's still some hierarchies and organizations that are like that but also career journeys tend not to be linear it, it particularly you know in most countries I know it's not the same in every country globally but most career journeys now are not linear um, and so, you you know, you people move side to side and they move up and then they might move kind of across a little bit and they might ch change sort of direction in terms of um, 
in terms of their focus and mine's certainly done that as well you know it started off very operational commercial um then moved to to more sort of commercial turnarounds then moved to like customer experience and now it's a bit of a bit of everything um so i'd say focus less on the next step almost and focus more on how do you do the job that you're doing now to the best of your ability and to the best of the abilities of the people around you and then those next steps emerge and come quite naturally as opposed to being uber focused on the next step and maybe not really fulfilling the role that you're in now and I think that can be a risk for some people in that you get too focused on that next step and and you're not really kind of focused enough on delivering what you've got to deliver now so so I think by doing that the humility naturally comes because you naturally start to pull people in and work with with people in a in a in a, an easier way and a and a different way um and I think the other thing that I would uh, encourage people to think about is is most people don't stay with one organization either and often when you're moving kind of up the career ladder you're moving organizations so actually when you join a new organization it's quite easy to lead with humility because often you just don't know the answer to everything right so you've got to ask the questions you've got to really hone those active listening skills you've got to learn to trust people you've got to learn more about people so um i think you know anybody who's recently moved organization or is moving organization that's a really good chance and a really good opportunity or even moving teams or departments within an organization it's a really good chance and opportunity to actually practice those skills practice that active listening which is a real core part of of um humility so those are really great things to practice so active listening and stay present and do a really good job in your current job and don't get too far out ahead of yourself. So I love that. And so is there something that you would love to leave everyone with, you know, in terms of humility or in terms of your experience and your, you know, journey to being chief customer officer? Um, I mean, we've covered so much already. Uh, <laughs> trying to trying to think of of what what else to to lead with, but I think the final part um, that I'd really encourage people to think about is building on those strengths. So, I think that as an individual and learning to self coach, but also when you're coaching other people, which you know comes as part of that kind of leading with humility and putting yourself into a position where you you can try and sort of unpick and unpack some thoughts and behaviors with others as well you know and and doing that in a humble way it can be quite challenging and quite difficult but i think one of the ways to do it is is to leverage people's strengths and one of the things that i often find particularly when i'm coaching or mentoring females over over males and again there's a spectrum is that females tend to present you know, with a long list of weaknesses, a long list of, well, I got feedback once I wasn't confident. I got feedback that I couldn't present. I got feedback that, you know, I was too detailed. All these kind of like negativity and weaknesses and things I must improve. And very rarely they're able to give me what their core strengths are. Um, but actually developing those strengths often is, is the way forward. So if somebody says to me, well, I'm too detailed, I would like, okay, well, detail is a good thing. Detail means we can make good decisions, but let's let's work out where that detail is holding you back and let's use that um, strength of detail to launch you forward in your career rather than trying to kind of work a way of somehow moving it to the side. And it's like, okay, what levels of detail can you be comfortable with? How can we progress you to the next level so you can be comfortable with someone else's detail that maybe you haven't gone through all of it when do you need more detail when don't you need more detail so I think like that ability to self-coach based on strengths and that ability to coach others based on strengths um and not get too focused on weaknesses you know I, I think it goes hand in hand with humility but perhaps in a way that people might not think about um straight out of the box so i think that would be my my final takeaway like as a person don't get dragged down by other people's negative 
feedback and your weaknesses, sometimes it says more about them than it says about you. Um, and really, you know, work on your strengths and, and lead from your strengths and build on your strengths. So that is so great. So if I can give everyone a little bit of homework from some of the amazing things that Kathy has shared, think about one strength that you have. How can you lean into it? When is it most appropriate to use it? How can you even improve on it or learn more or get even better? And then maybe even think about one thing that you need to improve upon and just take one step have one conversation with someone that can help shine some light read a book take a core or, or whatever and maybe give yourself some credit where credit is due uh kathy thank you so much for your time for sharing your wisdom i look forward to following your journey and i really appreciated your time today thanks Cheryl. super fun and lovely to chat